Welcome to your deep dive. Today, uh, we're going to be diving into the incredible world of your brain. Yeah. We're talking about the way that your brain changes and adapts all throughout your life. So we're talking about synaptic plasticity. That's right. Synaptic plasticity. Which is basically how your brain rewires itself based on your experiences. Yeah. It's how you learn, how you form memories, uh, even how you recover from injuries. It's kind of mind-blowing when you think about it that like all these daily experiences can actually physically change the structure of our brains? It really is. It all starts with those tiny gaps between neurons called synapses. Okay, so the synapses, those are the places where the information is actually transmitted, right? Yeah, think of them like uh, little crossroads or intersections inside this massive network that is your brain. And there are different types of synapses, right? It's not all just one size fits all. You got it. The most common type, those are your accidentic synapses. Those are like your main highways of the brain. Okay. Then you got your axisomatic synapses, Think of those as like the exits off the highway. The off-ramps. Exactly. And then lastly, you have your axo-exonic synapses. Those are like the smaller roads and side streets that connect everything together. So it's a whole network. It is. But how does that network actually change? Well, that's where synaptic plasticity comes in. Oh. These synapses, they can actually strengthen or weaken over time. Hmm. It's like turning up the volume on certain connections and turning it down on others, depending on which roads you're using the most. So the more you use a certain brain pathway, the stronger it gets. Precisely. Use it or lose it, right? Use it or lose it. And this happens on different time scales. Okay. You've got your short-term synaptic plasticity, which is kind of like the brain's quick change artist. Okay. These changes are very temporary. They only last for a few minutes at most. So it's kind of like taking a shortcut that eventually disappears if you don't keep using it. Exactly. And just like our muscles get tired after a workout, we also have something called synaptic depression. That's where the synapse gets worse at transmitting signals because it's been active for a while. So it's like use it or lose it, but don't overdo it. Yeah, you got it. And then mm -hmm. there are things like post-titanic potentiation or PTP, Okay. where after a burst of high activity, the synapse actually gets stronger for a bit. It's like giving your brain a quick workout. Interesting. Yeah. So that's really fascinating, all these short-term tweaks. But what about the long game? What about the changes that stick with us for years? Well, that's where long-term synaptic plasticity comes in. These are the real game changers. Okay. Think of it as the brain laying down new highways, building new exits, even demolishing old ones to make way for new learning and experiences. And to understand those long-term changes, we need to talk about sea slugs. You'd be surprised what we can learn from a sea slug, specifically huh. a type called aplesia. Okay. They have a really simple nervous system, which makes them perfect for studying long-term synaptic plasticity. I never thought I'd be taking brain advice from a slug, but I'm open to it. Right. So what's so special about aplesia? Well, they have this reflex where if you touch their siphon, they withdraw their gill. It's a simple reflex. And by studying this, Eric Kandel, a Nobel Prize winning neuroscientist, made some groundbreaking discoveries about how long-term plasticity works. Okay, so what did he find? Well, he found that if you repeatedly touch a plesia's siphon, that gill withdrawal reflex actually weakens over time. Mm. They essentially learn that the touch isn't a threat anymore, and this is called habituation. Oh, so it's kind of like when you get used to a loud noise over time. Exactly. Now, here's the really fascinating part. If you pair that touch with a mild electric shock, the opposite happens. The gill withdrawal reflex becomes even stronger. So the brain is like, okay, pay attention. This is important. Exactly. And Candle's work showed that these changes in behavior were due to physical changes at the synapse. Oh. Experience was literally rewiring their nervous systems. That is incredible. Our experiences actually change the physical structure of our brains. Precisely. And when we talk about long-term plasticity, there are two key players. Long-term potentiation, or LTP, and long-term depression, or LTD. Okay. Think of them as the yin and yang of learning. Okay, so tell me more about this dynamic duo. All right, so LTP, that's like forming a strong memory. Okay. The connection between those neurons is strengthened, so the more you access that information or repeat that action, the stronger those connections become. Makes sense. LTD, on the other hand, that's like weakening those unimportant connections. It's like deleting old voicemails on your phone to free up space. So LTP is strengthening the important connections, and LTD is pruning away the ones that we don't use as much. Exactly. It's like our brains have a built-in decluttering system. I like it decluttering. Now, one of the key places that LTP happens is in the hippocampus, a part of the brain that's essential for learning and memory. Okay. 
and researchers study this using a specific pathway within the hippocampus called the trisynaptic circuit. Okay, break that down for me. What is the trisynaptic circuit and how do scientists actually study it? So imagine it as a relay race of information between these different groups of neurons within the hippocampus. What? Scientists can actually measure the electrical activity of these neurons using a technique called electrophysiology. Wow. By stimulating the circuit and recording those signals, they can see how LTP strengthens connections over time. It's amazing how researchers can track these tiny electrical signals deep inside the brain. It really is remarkable. And two key receptors that are involved in LTP are the NMDA and AMPA receptors. Okay. Imagine the NMDA receptor like a door that needs two keys to open. Okay. It requires both glutamate, which is a neurotransmitter, to bind to it AMD, the receiving neuron, to already be active. It's like a two-factor authentication system for our neurons. Exactly. So what happens once that door is open? Well, that's where AMPA receptors come in, our second key player. Okay. When LTP occurs, more AMPA receptors appear on the receiving neuron, which strengthens that connection, making it easier for that signal to be transmitted in the future. So it's like widening the road to allow more traffic to flow through. Precisely. The more AMPA receptors you have, the stronger the signal. Exactly. And this brings us to this intriguing concept of silent synapses. Silent synapses, what are those? These synapses have the potential to transmit signals, but they're inactive because they lack those AMPA receptors. So like roads that are built but not yet open to traffic. Exactly. And research suggests that LTP might actually play a role in unsilencing these synapses by promoting the expression of those AMPA receptors. So, like, our brains have all this hidden potential just waiting to be unlocked. Isn't that incredible? It really is. And speaking of unlocking potential, I think it's time we discuss critical periods in brain development. Perfect segue. Critical periods are essentially these windows of opportunity when specific experiences have the most significant and lasting impact on the brain. So it's kind of like a sculptor working with clay. There's a specific time when that clay is the most moldable and the sculptor's hands, those are the experiences that shape it. Exactly. And a classic example of this is imprinting in geese. Ah, yes. The goslings following Conrad Lorenz around like he was their mother. Exactly. Lorenz found that goslings, they form a really strong attachment to the first moving object they see during a specific period after hatching which is usually their mother. Right. But in Lorenz's experiment, it was him. And this is called imprinting. And it really highlights how powerful these early experiences can be. So that they imprint on whatever they're exposed to during that specific window. Yes. And this isn't just limited to geese or even to visual cues. Okay. Other animals might imprint on sounds or smells, for example. Oh, interesting. And imprinting-like behavior, that's not limited to birds either. It's been observed in mammals, too including us. So early social bonding is critical for all sorts of species, not just geese. That's right. And a classic example of this is Harry Harlow's work with rhesus monkeys. Right, with the wire mothers and the cloth mothers. Exactly. And the baby monkeys clung to that soft cloth mother, even though the wire one was the one that provided food. Yeah, it showed just how important that comfort and touch are early on for healthy development. So we've seen how these critical periods work in birds and monkeys, but what about us humans? Right. Where do vision and language fit into all of this? Well, vision is a great example. We've learned a lot from monocular deprivation studies okay. where researchers temporarily block the vision in one eye during a critical period in kittens. So they block one eye early on, and what happens? Even though there's nothing wrong with the eye itself, it essentially becomes functionally blind because the brain basically forgets how to see from that eye. Wow, really? Yeah. So the brain just prioritizes the eye that's getting the input during that critical period. It's a perfect example of use it or lose it during brain development. That is wild. It makes those childhood eye exams seem even more important. Oh, absolutely. Early detection and treatment of any vision problems is critical during those early years when that visual system is at its most malleable. So we got vision. What about language? Is there a similar critical period for that? Absolutely. Just like with vision, the ability to learn a language is strongest early in life. Children are like sponges. They just soak up language effortlessly. Yeah. And research suggests that there is a critical period for language acquisition. It extends from early infancy to late childhood. That makes sense. Yeah. What about children who are deaf? Do they have a critical period for language, even if it's not spoken language? That's a great question, and the answer is yes. Deaf children exposed to sign language early on 
they go through similar stages of language development as hearing children. Okay. And there's even evidence that they babble with their hands, just like hearing babies babble with their voices. Babbling with their hands. That's uh-huh. fascinating. So it seems like the brain is wired for language regardless of whether it's coming through our ears or our eyes. Precisely. It highlights that incredible flexibility of the brain, especially during those critical periods. So we've talked about how our experiences, especially early in life, can physically rewire our brains. But what happens when things go wrong? Can our brains repair themselves after an injury? That's a great question, and it leads us to another fascinating aspect of brain plasticity, its capacity for repair and regeneration. And we'll delve into that right after this quick break. Yeah, so uh, the brain, unlike some of our other organs, it has a more limited ability to regenerate. Mm -hmm. It's kind of like a delicate tapestry. It's harder to repair once it's damaged. So it's not like, say, a cut on your skin that heals really quickly? Not quite, no. When we talk about neurons, there are three main types of repair. Okay. The first and the most common, especially in the peripheral nervous system, is what we call axon regrowth. Okay, so axon regrowth, remind me, what is the axon again? Right, so the axon, that's like the long slender cable that transmits the signals from a neuron. So axon regrowth is like if you imagine trying to repair a severed cable, you're trying to get those signals flowing again. So it is possible for those connections to be reestablished. To some extent, yes. Then we have the repair or regrowth of the damaged neurons themselves. Okay. That's a little more complex. That's like internal repairs. Mm. Often this involves glial cells, those support cells that we talked about earlier. Okay. And is that as common as the axon regrowth? It's less common, especially in the central nervous system. So the brain and spinal cord, they have a much harder time with this kind of repair than, say, the nerves in the rest of your body. Is that because of the glial scars that we were talking about earlier? That definitely plays a role, yeah. Remember, they can sometimes form a barrier to regeneration. Right. It's like the construction crew showing up and building a wall around the damaged area instead of actually fixing it. Ah, not ideal. Right. And then finally, we have the rarest form of repair. Okay. Which is replacing those damaged neurons with brand new ones generated from stem cells. Stem cells, those are like the blank slates of the body, right? They can become any type of cell. Exactly. It's a really promising area of research, but uh, we're still in the very early stages of understanding how to use stem cells effectively for brain repair. So not a magic bullet just yet, but definitely a lot of potential there. You mentioned that axon regrowth is more common in the peripheral nervous system. Right. Can you give me an example of how that works? Sure. One of the most fascinating examples I can think of is actually a self-experiment by a doctor named Henry Head. Okay. Back in the early 20th century. Okay. He actually severed and rejoined his own radial nerve. He cut his own nerve. Talk about dedication to science. I know, right? He wanted to understand exactly how peripheral nerves regenerate. Wow. And incredibly, he meticulously documented his sensory recovery over several months. So he was like his own living, breathing lab experiment. Yeah. That's wild. So why are peripheral nerves better at regenerating? Well, one key factor is the presence of these glial cells we talked about earlier called Schwann cells. The same ones that can cause those glial scars. The very same. Okay. But in the peripheral nervous system, they actually act like guides. Okay. They form a path for that damaged axon to follow, to reconnect. So they're like tiny construction workers, clearing debris and laying down fresh pavement for those neural pathways to be rebuilt. Exactly. And it's not just the Schwann cells. You also have fibroblasts that provide structural support, macrophages that clean up debris, and endothelial cells that help rebuild those blood vessels, making sure that the regenerating nerve gets the nutrients it needs. Wow. So it's like a whole team of microscopic helpers working together. It really is incredible. That's amazing. But you said even peripheral nerve regeneration has its challenges. It does, yeah. For one, it's slow. Okay. And the further the injury is from the cell body, the less likely it is to fully recover. Mm -hmm. Plus, things like scarring or inflammation, those can create roadblocks for those regenerating axons. So it's like trying to navigate a really dense forest after a storm. There's like debris everywhere. A very accurate analogy. I like it. Mm -hmm. There's also the risk that that regenerating axon could connect to the wrong target, which can lead to things like miswiring and functional problems. 
Oh, so it's not always a perfect repair job, even in the peripheral nervous system. Unfortunately not. But researchers are exploring some really fascinating ways to improve nerve regeneration using things like artificial biomaterials. Artificial biomaterials, what are those? Think of them like scaffolds that can be implanted to guide that axon regrowth. Okay. Kind of like building a bridge over a damaged section of a nerve. That's incredible. So you're creating an artificial environment to encourage those nerves to heal. Precisely. And these wire materials, they're designed to mimic the natural environment of that peripheral nervous system as much as possible, making it as conducive to regeneration as possible. It's amazing how scientists are constantly coming up with innovative ways to help the body heal. Yeah. So we talked about peripheral nerve regeneration. What about central nerve regeneration? Why is that so much harder? Well, one major reason is the environment within that central nervous system, as we touched upon, it's just not as good at healing as the peripheral nervous system. Mm -hmm. Those glial scars play a role. And the lack of those helpful Schwann cells in the central nervous system right. doesn't help either. So it's like the central nervous system is missing some of the key players in that repair crew. Exactly. Plus, when the blood-brain barrier is disrupted after an injury, right. it can actually create more inflammation, which can hinder healing. So even our own immune response can sometimes backfire in the brain. That's right, yeah. But despite these challenges, research into improving central nerve regeneration is ongoing and showing some really promising results. That's great news. Now, before the break, we were talking about neurogenesis, the birth of new neurons. Right. And you said it's not as robust in the adult mammalian brain as it is in other organisms, but it does still occur. Absolutely. We mainly see it in the olfactory bulb, which is involved in our sense of smell, and in the hippocampus, that memory-related region we discussed earlier. Wait, so even in adulthood, our brains can still make new neurons. Where do they come from? They come from what we call neural stem cells, okay. which are basically the brain's reserve of these adaptable cells. They can become various types of brain cells, including new neurons. So those neural stem cells, they're like the multi-talented actors of the brain. They can play any role. Precisely. And in the adult brain, they mainly hang out in two spots, what we call the subventricular zone, or SVZ, okay. and the subgranular zone, or SGZ. So it's like the brain's own little neuron nursery. Yeah, exactly. And so the ones that are born in the SVZ, those ones are quite adventurous. They migrate to the olfactory bulb. Okay. Where they integrate into the existing circuits there. It's like there's a neuronal highway that guides them to their new home. That's fascinating. And what about the ones born in the SGZ? Those tend to stay put in the hippocampus, and we think they might play a role in learning, memory, maybe even mood. So even in adulthood, our brains are constantly undergoing this process of renewal and rewiring. That's incredibly encouraging. It is. It's like those brain training games that people play. Does that actually work? Do we know if those can boost neurogenesis? That's a great question, and there's a lot of research focused on that very question. Things like exercise, enriching environments, even certain diets seem to have an influence on neurogenesis, but more research is definitely needed to say, for sure. It's a really fascinating area of research. You mentioned nuclear weapons earlier mm. and neurogenesis, and that definitely piqued my interest. Oh, yeah. It's a fascinating example of how sometimes these seemingly unrelated events can actually lead to scientific breakthroughs. Okay. So you see, during the era of above-ground nuclear testing, right. there was this spike in a radioactive form of carbon called carbon-14 in the atmosphere. Okay, and this carbon-14 made its way into our food chain, eventually ending up in people's bodies. Exactly. And since carbon is a building block of DNA, right. this spike in carbon-14 basically acted like a timestamp. Okay. So by studying the brains of people who lived through that era, researchers could actually see if new neurons were being generated in the adult human brain, specifically in a region called the cerebral cortex. So by analyzing the levels of carbon-14 in their brain cells, they could tell when those cells were born. That's brilliant. It is really clever, and what they found was really intriguing. What did they find? So people who were born before that spike in carbon-14, they didn't have detectable levels in their cortical neurons, suggesting that those neurons were all older, they hadn't been replaced. So no evidence of neurogenesis in the adult cortex for those folks. Right. But individuals who were born during or after that peak of carbon-14 did have detectable levels in their cortical neurons, suggesting that those neurons were born later in adulthood. The, the nuclear testing era, while obviously a very dark chapter in human history, 
inadvertently provided this unique window into the brain's ability to actually generate new neurons in adulthood. Exactly. And it really challenged this long-held belief that the adult brain was incapable of producing new neurons, particularly in that region of the cortex. That is incredible. It's amazing how science can find these clues in the most unexpected places. Isn't it fascinating? It really is. But hold on. If this study found evidence of these new neurons in some people, why is there still this debate about whether neurogenesis actually happens in the adult cortex? Well, you see, those carbon-14 studies, while groundbreaking, they weren't perfect. Okay, what were some of the limitations? Well, for one, the sample size was relatively small. Okay. So it's always a question of whether those findings from a limited group of people can be generalized to everyone. Okay. Plus, interpreting the carbon-14 data, it's not always straightforward. Hmm. It can tell us when a neuron was born, but it can't tell us everything about its history. Okay, so like some of those newer neurons in the cortex might have actually been born earlier, but just incorporated that carbon-14 later on. Exactly. And so hmm. that's led to this ongoing debate. Right. Some scientists believe that the evidence for adult cortical neurogenesis in humans is still, well, up for debate. Okay, so the jury is still out on widespread neurogenesis in the adult cortex, but it's definitely happening in other parts of the brain. Right. What's the key takeaway here? I think the key takeaway, even with this debate, is that this research has opened up incredible new possibilities. Okay. Whether or not the cortex is making tons of new neurons, the fact that neurogenesis is happening at all in adults is huge. Yeah, it really underscores how adaptable our brains really are even as we age. It really does. Speaking of adaptation, I, I've heard about these fMRI studies showing that the brain can actually reorganize itself after things like a stroke. Is that related to what we're talking about? Absolutely. Those studies are like watching the brain's amazing recovery process in action. Hmm. So, for example, imagine someone has a stroke that affects the part of their brain that controls hand movement. Yeah. So they might have weakness, maybe even paralysis in that hand. Right. But what's incredible is that over time with therapy, the brain can actually reorganize itself to compensate for that damage. Wow. And fMRI studies, they can actually show this. You'll see increased activity in the areas around that damaged part of the brain, like neighbors pitching in to help out. So the brain is like, OK, we lost some players, but the game is still on. Time to adjust the game plan. Exactly. And sometimes you'll see entirely different parts of the brain can even step in to help out. It's not just those immediate neighbors. Wow. It's really a beautiful example of just how flexible the brain can be. It makes you realize there's so much more going on in there than we even realize. Oh, well, absolutely. It's like our brains are finding these workarounds and rewiring on the fly. Precisely. And this is why things like rehabilitation after stroke are so crucial. Because by engaging in that targeted therapy, we're essentially guiding that rewiring process. Huh? We're helping the brain form those new connections, restore function. That's incredible. Yeah. So while we may not be able to just like regrow massive amounts of brain tissue, we can encourage the brain to adapt and find new ways of doing things. Exactly. And that ability to adapt, to rewire, to reorganize, I mean, that's what makes the brain so remarkable. It's a really powerful message of resilience. Even in the face of injury, the brain wants to heal and find a way forward. Absolutely. And the more we understand about synaptic plasticity and regeneration, the better equipped we'll be to actually support that healing process. Well, this deep dive has been an incredible journey. It really has. From tiny synapses to stem cells to the brain's ability to rewire itself after injury. It's amazing to see how adaptable and resilient this organ truly is. It really is. It's a reminder that we're not fixed. You know, we're constantly evolving and our experiences, our choices, even our thoughts, they all shape the physical structure of our brains. What a powerful thought to end on. To our listeners, thank you for joining us on this exploration of synaptic plasticity and regeneration. It's a field that's just brimming with possibilities and new discoveries every day. And remember, when it comes to the brain and its potential for change and healing, we're only just scratching the surface.